Good morning. My name is Suzanne Dion with Harmony Place Monterey in Monterey, California, and welcome to the fourth webinar of our webinar series, Treating Sexual Compulsivity, Trauma, and Bipolar Disorder. Today's webinar features psychotherapy for bipolar disorder with Dr. Mark Schwartz. Dr. Schwartz is currently clinical director of Harmony Place Monterey in Monterey, California. He worked with Masters and Johnson's for at least 16 years and worked directly with Dr. Masters for almost 20 years. He is specializing in post-traumatic stress disorder, trauma, intimacy disorders, and mental health issues. Particularly today, he'll be discussing his work and revelations with bipolar. Dr. Schwartz, as I said, was formerly with uh, Masters and Johnson's Institute and was director there also of the Trauma and Dissociative Disorders Program and is one of the founders of Castlewood and Monarch Hook Treatment Centers specializing in eating disorders. He was trained directly by sex experts, Masters and Johnson, for treatment of sexual dysfunction and lack of sexual desire and arousal. Dr. Schwartz has lectured to tens of thousands of individuals and clinicians and practitioners and is a specialist and expert with a really uh, exciting and progressive view on and getting to the origin and problems of what are otherwise symptoms of, of trauma. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Schwartz. Take it away. Thanks, Suzanne, and good morning. Uh, thank you for joining me for breakfast on the West Coast and snow on the West and East Coast. I want to just give you a short introduction about the lens by which I want to approach this. Sometimes, you know, I've been doing this for 50 years, and some of you are my old friends, and hello. And you might wonder where I went from specializing in sexual problems to eating disorders now over to bipolar. But I had this really unique training. I was at Johns Hopkins with a guy named John Money, and he was a medical psychologist. And what he was saying to me was that what we want to do is we want to follow people who have sort of uh, accidents at birth or um, some sort of abnormal state as beginning to understand the normal state. And that really uh, was the lens of medical psychology that I was trained in. So as I approach bipolar, I'm not a physician. And uh, so what I want to be talking from is, first of all, um, being able to let non-physicians know what they need to know in order to be able to do adequate psychotherapy with their patients. And for physicians to be able to uh, understand what they're not doing that needs to be done with bipolar disorder from a psychotherapy vantage point. So that's sort of my premise. What I'm interested in is, first of all, just to tell you that there are probably 5 million people with bipolar disorder. Um, and that's a lot. And the biggest change is, is that we're now diagnosing bipolar disorder in childhood and adolescence. And there's just tons that we need to know about that. And we have this illusion that we're doing something really good, except for the fact that in varieties of research studies, what has been found is that 40% of bipolar patients are not getting any treatment. And of the ones who are getting treatment, 50% um, of those people are not being treated adequately um, by psychiatry. Now that may sound harsh, but I take that right from Kaplan and Sadek's book um, on uh, the textbook of psychiatry, most recent edition, which is where you can get a lot of authoritative information. So the question is, why is it that there's inadequate treatment and what seems to be the problem? Um, there's a couple things that I would say. First of all, a lot of bipolar seems to be induced by psychiatry. So for example, one of the leading causes of the origins of bipolar is when you give a, 
serotonin reuptake inhibitor to a depressed patient. And for bipolar patients, oftentimes it will induce the first manic episode. We all know that. So that's a bit of a problem. The first thing I, I want to be able to do just to get us sort of all talking about the same thing is that I laid out the principles in the treatment of bipolar disorders from the Kaplan and Sadek book. And my idea is just to tell you sort of everything you need to know the first thing. What I'm going to do in this workshop is I'm going to give you sort of the medical part of it. Then I'm going to talk to you about what's going on in the brain. And then I'm going to talk about what's not being done in psychotherapy that needs to be done. So those are the three components of what I want to be able to say. And so the first part is just simply to sort of lay out what bipolar is and how to be able to treat it. And you can see from the basis that most people who are thinking about bipolar are focused on having a manic episode in bipolar one. And so, you know, the basic idea is give somebody lithium. The trouble is, is that lithium only works in about 40% of cases. And so the question is what happens when lithium doesn't work and why does lithium work? When I was a young whippersnapper, they would give lithium, but they would say, we don't really understand how it works. And what's so amazing about some of this newer work is we're beginning to understand what lithium actually does in the brain. And it tends to be prophylactic, meaning that there's this new work with children with bipolar disorder. It's a great book called Treatment of Bipolar with Children and Adolescents by Barbara Geller and Melissa DiBella. And um, it's a fantastic book and we'll send you a reference on it. But what's so amazing about children with bipolar is that you can study what happens when you give them lithium. And the first thing you need to know is that lithium um, actually is prophylactic. And what occurs in the brain is that if you give lithium, it, you can present, basically bipolar is a problem which will get worse over time. Every time you have sort of a seizure with bipolar, it potentiates the next one and the next one. So if you give lithium at a young age, you can actually decrease the morbidity and normalize brain pathways. And when I say brain pathways, there's a ton of things that lithium do, does to, for a person. And they're beginning to isolate that. So what I think about this is that all of us have moods where we go up and down. And it's probably more of a spectrum disorder. And if we can study this extreme and so look at what lithium is doing and where it's doing it, then what we can do is be able to um, understand about normal mood states. So when lithium doesn't work, what do you do? Well, let me just, if you're taking notes, let me just sort of give you this sort of as a way to help understand the rest of my talk, which is that basically there are, you know, four classes of drugs to treat bipolar. Lithium is the first one, which is more of to deal with the seizures. The second are anti-seizure drugs. And so Tegretol, Depakote, Lamictal, Neurotin, Topamax, those are all seizure medications. And um, they, when lithium doesn't work, those anti-seizure medications can be utilized. But what's so interesting is each one of those are different and they work in different parts of the brain. And so as you study one drug not working, you can begin to see in an isolated way because clearly bipolar is working in very mi mixed in many parts of the brain, uh, particularly the prefrontal cortex and the limbic system. The second class of drugs, which we'll be talking about are mood stabilizers. And um, they have really revolutionized our treatment. And one of my favorites is Abilify because you can give that in an injection form. And one of the greatest problems with working with mood, with the mood problems is that people don't take their medication. Um, also, Geodone and Latuda is particularly useful in Zyprexa and Seroquel. Um, I have a client who, um, whenever she can feel a bipolar episode coming on of mania, what she knows is to take an extra dose of PRN and Zyprexa, and it really helps her be able to uh, prevent the episode from occurring. Um, and it, it just works like kind of, kind of as a fire drill to 
prevent uh, the next disaster. The third area that is of great interest are the atypical antipsychotics, which have less of the side effects of other psychotics. And uh, Clausrel is one of those, which is really effective with depression. Zyprexa and Resperidol and Seroquel are, are the ones that are most common. Now, I emphasize that because although there is a tremendous emphasis in bipolar work on working with manic episodes for the bipolar one patient, you know, the real truth is, is that most of the clients are going to have uh, chronic depression as their major difficulty, and they're going to be living with major depressive disorder. And the question is, if SSRIs precipitate a manic episode, then what do you do for the chronic depressive? Now, in a typical psychotherapy practice like ours, where we have a partial hospitalization program, we're getting clients who are being medicated for the depression, but it is severe and it won't lift. And so it's very frustrating for the client, obviously, and also for the health professional, because what will happen is they'll go to a psychiatrist, the psychiatrist will give them one med, when that doesn't work, they'll give them two meds, when that doesn't work, they'll give them three meds. And each of them has their own side effect spectrum. And for the physician, you know, they're desperate to try to find something to relieve that person's depression. Uh, and uh, the, the difficulty is, is that the, the person's not getting better. Now, one of the things that's really critical is that a lot of patients don't tell the whole truth. And so why aren't they getting better? Well, first of all, um, many of them are not complying with their medication. I would say the majority are not taking their medication as prescribed. And that uh, they won't say that out loud, but they have a hard time remembering to take pills. That's why I'm pretty excited about the new injection form. Um, the second problem is that most psychiatrists, statistically speaking, are using monotherapy, meaning that they're using one medication like lithia or Depica. And the literature suggests that most of the patients are not gonna get better on monotherapy. They, that clients require at least two meds, uh, usually a uh, something like a mood stabilizer and an atypical antipsychotic simultaneously in order to be able to get better. So the second reason that people aren't getting better is they're not being medicated right. And the third is that the vast majority, at least more than half, are doing drugs and alcohol as a way of medicating themselves in some ways. And there's some really interesting research showing that, that if a person does something like cocaine, some of the irregularities in the brain become more regular. So when I say medicating their own uh, depression, uh, some of these drugs seem to have actually a beneficial effect, although they're highly habitual, and I'm not saying that a person should do it. I'm saying that I understand why they do it. And then finally, what makes this picture even more confusing is that there are so many other addictions other than drugs and alcohol that the person uses in an ameliorative way, which then masks the symptoms. Being a specialist in eating disorder, what I discover is, is that after I'm successful with a client in getting the eating disorder under control and get them sober, so to speak, oftentimes the depression symptoms just become amplified and that they're using these uh, compulsive disorders as a way of numbing out in a variety of ways. The other piece of that, which I think is really critical, is that the number one thing that induces a lot of the depressive and manic symptoms is stress and distress. And a lot of times people decide on an addiction such as eating disorder or sex addiction or some other compulsive behavior as a way of coping with stress and distress. And if you take that away from them, then the stress increases and you precipitate an increased bipolar episode. So these comorbidities, I'd say the vast majority of bipolar patients have comorbidity and have a variety of difficulties. So not only are we treating the bipolar, but we might be treating attention deficit disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, and a whole variety of other disorders, which makes it complicated.
So what I would say is that we're really on a frontier here. So I don't mean to be critical of psychiatry because I'm not. I'm just saying that so much of this stuff is brand new. And honestly, there are very, very few data. And practically, you know, particularly children and adolescents, which is, you know, where 50% of this begins, um, there are very few longitudinal studies to look at combinations of medications and how and why they're useful. But if you look at the Kaplan book, what you can see is, you know, why is it that you know, using one drug might be superior to using a different drug? So if you use something like Zyprexa, how's that different than Seroquel? Or if you use something like Geodone, how's that different than Zyprexa? And for some people, Geodone is going to increase the symptoms. Uh, and for others, it'll decrease the symptoms. So the other than piece that's really critical is that there are huge individual differences between within clients because it's not a simple disorder. It's obviously in various parts of the brain that are injured in some ways. So the more you understand the psychophysiology and the brain mechanisms involved, the more you can come up with an intelligent form. So I work with a certain set of psychiatrists who are so wise, and when something isn't working, they come up with a logical, rational alternative to that until they can find something that gives the person symptom relief. I have one client right now who, you know, has probably, well, he was on something like 15 meds when he came in, and um, the idea was that with all the side effects of the meds, he could barely get out of bed. So what we had to do is detox him some of the meds he was on, come up with a pharmacology that made sense, and even that, he was chronically depressed. So the psychotherapy was good. I was doing my very best, but it wasn't really effective. So he started smoking marijuana, and the depression just lifted. Now, there's no makes no sense at all why that would be true, um, but clinically it is. So, you know, there's so much we don't know and again, I'm not recommending that this person does marijuana. He discovered this on his own. But for somebody who was 10 years where he was severely depressed and then suddenly the depression completely lifted, you know, there's so much to know in this area. Okay, so that's where I want to start. And that's my introduction. So now what I want to do is go through a bit of your handouts. I thought just as a gift, I'd like to give you the mood disorder questionnaire. And um, these are the two questionnaires, the mood disorder and the bipolar spectrum diagnostic skill that I use. And I find most useful in diagnosing and assessing because honestly, it's very, very tricky to diagnose bipolar. And I want to tell you why. Um, in the slide number on page eight, what you see is a graph, and this is looking at symptoms in children. And what makes it confusing with children, turn to page eight, is that um, it looks a lot like attention deficit disorder because there's high energy and high distractibility and all those ADHD kinds of symptoms. So what is it that separates ADHD from bipolar? Well, one thing that's most diagnostic is the person will go a night or two without sleep. That's pretty important. And so if the person is going a night or two without sleep, then I would suspect bipolar. Two, of course, is family history of bipolar, particularly uh, in, in the direct family and the family before that. Um, three, which is a pretty interesting symptom, is grandiosity. Grandiosity can be pretty subtle. Um, an example of that would be, I have a client who believes that he deserves to be able to start his career at the top and feels greatly entitled. And he looks very narcissistic. But in truth, it doesn't, it's not really narcissistic, it's more grandiosity. And that's a hint that we're really dealing with bipolar disorder. Um, the other big thing is even in young people is hypersexuality. So with hypersexuality, um, the person uh, oftentimes will go online and begin to find uh, hookups in varieties of way at a young age. And so if you're getting hypersexuality, uh, and the other piece, the, the other symptom that oftentimes gives it away is they'll start a lot of tasks but don't finish them. So they get really excited about something and then they don't really complete it. So I have a client who 
you know, has maybe have five different careers that they've started, but they've never finished any one of them, and they're utterly frustrated in varieties of ways. There are also very subtle thinking errors that oftentimes they have. I, 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 my big uh, focus is seeing couples and families. And when I treat bipolar, I almost always bring the couple and family in because it's going to be a family illness, and we have to teach the family how to both assess it, diagnose it, know what's going on, and know why it's going on and what to do about it uh, in order to help the client because they oftentimes won't see it themselves. So one of the things I'm going to say to you is we need to do what's called metacognitive therapy. Metacognitive therapy is teaching people how to observe themselves in an effective way to know what these symptoms are, to know that they're in symptoms. But honestly, one of the most interesting cognitive deficits is a lot of them just aren't able to do that. And so I had a wife of a client say to me recently, you know, the person is unable to monitor themselves. And so when they're doing something that fits into grandiosity or a hyperactivity, oftentimes they're unable to see themselves in a metacognitive way. So um, that's really important. Um, so that we can uh, be aware that some of these cognitive deficits are really structural. And if they are structural, oftentimes we have to do overlearning in a variety of ways. Okay, so we're on page nine, obviously. And what we're looking at are these symptoms. So just to review, because you've got the slide up right now, is we're looking at symptoms, we're looking at hypersexuality, we're looking at um, grandiosity, and uh, overproductivity without finishing something. Uh, and uh, you can see those symptoms in terms of percentage here. Okay, as we go to the next slide. Now, what I tried to say earlier is that um, often the, the children with bipolar look a little bit different than the adults. And that probably has to do with the fact that bipolar is a progressive illness. And more and more damage is done to the central nervous system every time they have sort of a seizure or a bipolar episode. And it's a way to think of it in that way. And so if you take lithium, for example, you are actually preventing the destruction of the brain. It's prophylactic. And that's mind-blowing because you're not just taking it to help you, but you're actually preventing the brain from deteriorating in a variety of ways. And that's so important to be able to help explain to the client. I have pictures of the brain that I use, and I show them where lithium is working and I show them what happens when they have a bipolar episode and where the deterioration of the brain occurs and then I show how lithium can actually prevent that or repair it and honestly it, it increases compliance dramatically when they see it as, as a prophylactic. Now the depression and the manic symptoms are not distinct like there is in the adult. It's less cyclic and there's a lot of ups and downs on a short-term basis. So it looks more like a mix. Uh, they have psychomotor agitation, difficulties with sleep, difficulties with concentration. Um, and that children have a poor response. So if you give an antidepressant or you give an ADHD med, oftentimes you'll precipitate a full-blown manic episode. So it's important to know what not to do as well as to know what to do. All right, next slide. So um, that this is occurring in the prefrontal cortex as well as in the limbic areas. And what I want to emphasize throughout this talk is that where the psychotherapist comes in and is critical is that I think stress is the major difficulty here. And so, so many of these meds that you're given have the function of stress management. They work as shock absorbers. And so if you can teach somebody stress management and problem solving skills at a cognitive behavioral level, it may be as effective or more effective than actually some of these medications and don't have side effects. And so, you know, mindfulness and meditation and stress management, you know, 101, you know, probably is the treatment of choice for young people and teaching them how to be able to get better than the average person in dealing with distress. Now, if you come from a home like so many of my clients where 
there is chronic trauma, uh, complex trauma, and tremendous disruption of the marital relational family unit, then it is going to uh, dramatically increase the symptomatology, frequency, duration, and deterioration of the brain. So obviously, uh, that's where we need to be thinking in psychotherapy. And, you know, I read maybe 10 books on bipolar in preparation for this. You know, I've read, um, you know, Miklowitz's book, which I think is um, sort of the Bible. I read um, A Cognotherapy Approach by Newman, others in treating bipolar disorder, and I'll show you references of this. But in all of those, their psychoeducational is excellent. However, what they don't say is what I want to say today, which is that, I think that the real work is in the family of origin and in working with trauma uh, and internal fragmentation of the personality. So those of you who've heard me before talk about what I call intimacy and intimacy disorder, I think that is at the core of the treatment of bipolar. And so I'm gonna be saying a lot about that if you stay with me for a full two hours. Okay, next slide, we're now at either 12 or 13 common symptoms of mania in children and adolescents. And in it, I simply, um, well, let me talk about this first. This is the, what, uh, what's going on with lithium. And I think this is sort of mind blowing. So and if you get intimidated by all this biological stuff, don't, because it's really very basic. And this has to, you have to explain this to the client, which is that um, the myo-inositol levels really means that at a cellular level, what lithium is doing is repairing some of the damage that has occurred with neurons firing. And it really is preventative in changing these levels. Um, it normalizes platelet serotonogenic and GABA. Uh, it decreases dopamine, increases acetylcholine, reduces norepinephrine. So it's, it's doing an enormous amount in different areas of the brain. And so I used to think, well, they're just dumping this stuff in. They don't really know how it works. And, you know, it, it's hitting the, obviously the neuron and, and what's going on there. But now the work is 20 years later, much more sophisticated, and they're identifying this. And like I said earlier, and this fascinates me because all of us have mood problems. I think of bipolar as a more of a spectrum disorder anyway. And the, between 15 and 28% of adults with bipolar disorder have the onset before the age of 13. That's pretty important between 50 and 66% before the age of 19. Okay, so that's important because if you think about kids in school and you know, how much we're diagnosing ADHD, just think about how much we're not diagnosing bipolar. And if we don't diagnose that the cost is further deterioration of the brain. So we're oftentimes giving these kids, uh, you know, Adderall and Vyvanse and the question is, what do those drugs do to the deterioration of the brain, um, potentially in precipitating further bipolar episodes? There's so much we don't know about this. But doing proper diagnostic work is essential. The other thing we do is we give them a lot of SSRIs, which, as I said, is iatrogenically uh, oftentimes producing further deterioration. Now, on the right side, it says persons with the onset of bipolar disorder in child analysts have much more severe, adverse, and continue a cycling course of the illness than adults, often with preponderance of mixed episodes, which are a lot harder to treat, um, and active psychosis and suicidal ideation. Let's remember that 15 to 20 percent of patients with bipolar are going to kill themselves. So we're not talking about small things here. And if we really can prevent this from occurring, just think of how useful it is to have accurate information about diagnosis and treatment of this problem. Um, and as you can see, as I said earlier, there's a lot of comorbidity. And oftentimes, I think of the comorbidity as sort of like a red herring. You chase the symptom, but you miss the disorder. And so you treat the alcoholism, <coughs> or you treat the attention deficit disorder, or you treat the eating disorder. And what you're missing is this the slow deterioration of the brain because we're not adequately diagnosing and treating what's behind it in some way. All right. Let's go to the next slide. So um, it says here, uh, this interesting study by Noah and their colleagues took 42 children and adolescents 
with panic, hypomanic, or mixed episodes associated with bipolar one and bipolar two. And these youths were randomized into a six week treatment protocol. They either received lithium, Depakote, um, sodium, or Tegretol. And these studies found that all three medications had approximate equal effectiveness. So that's pretty important because um, the decision to use one of these drugs versus another may not have that much clinical significance. But if one isn't working, often another does. Based on these findings, many use with bipolar illness may not fully respond to drug monotherapy. I would say that the literature is suggesting now, and certainly in the textbook of psychiatry, what it says is that monotherapy is generally ineffective. 40% of the patients are on monotherapy, meaning one medication, and the literature suggests that one medication is not going to be effective. So most people are not being affected, treated effectively. But Finling and their colleagues treated 90 children and adolescents between the ages of 5 and 17 with lithium and Depakote, and they had substantial symptomatic improvement that was larger in magnitude than what had been described previously. So um, if you're using two meds, that probably is the effective treatment regime at this point. Now, I've been mentioned bipolar without really separating bipolar one from bipolar two. So I think now I need to get a little tighter and say that the biggest issue with bipolar one and bipolar two is that most of the clients are severely depressed most of the time. Um, they're gonna have maybe four or five manic episodes on bipolar one, which is very dangerous and need to be understood and we'll talk about that. But you know, the real problem in the field is what to do with these real chronic depressions that aren't being adequately rectified uh, or somehow uh, treated effectively with medication. And I'm suggesting to you that part of it is we're in a frontier here medically, but also that we need to be thinking that psychotherapy is an essential component of this process and we're not probably doing adequate psychotherapy. So that's gonna be what I'm gonna be saying a lot today. So by definition, patients with bipolar two have less severe mood elevations because they're hypomanic rather than manic. And those of you who don't know hypomanic, it means that they're going faster than other people. They have start a lot of tasks but don't finish them. Uh, they have flight of ideas um, and uh, they're difficult to live with. Um, but with bipolar one, you're gonna get a psychotic episode, you're gonna need psychiatric hospitalization, you're gonna have full-blown manic episodes, and they do things like spend all their money and go into great debt and end up really uh, uh, causing tremendous problems in relationships. So a lot of emphasis on bipolar one, but what I'm saying here is that bipolar two should not be considered bipolar light, meaning that somehow they're less of a problem because bipolar two um, is a nasty problem and they're really severely depressed many times. And that um, we need to be thinking about what to do with bipolar two um, because they're spending so much time depressed um, and there's a lot more rapid cycling with this in some ways. So when I talk to you about this, I guess what I'm saying is, is that, that the bipolar two is a highly variable illness and one medication uh, may be useful for one client, a different medication for a different client. And so we're gonna slowly begin to test that out. What I love about our place is, you know, we have a partial hospitalization where people come in for six hours a day or an IOP that come in for three hours a day. So we see them four times a week in individual psychotherapy and we're watching them closely. Psychiatrist sees them every week. So we try a med, we look at the effect of it. If we need to tweak it, add to it or change it, we can do it. And so in a relatively short period of time, like a month, we can begin to get them on the right track. And I love this model. Those of you who know my history, I've worked in a hospital, I've worked in a residential treatment center, and I evolved to working in partial hospitalization because there you're out there in real life. And I can do a lot more life coaching. What was happening in the residential facility is this that, yeah, they're stress-free. And yes, you know, in the inpatient facility, we can work as a laboratory and try to get them uh, uh, controlled. But as soon as they leave that, they're 
have an onslaught of stress and most of them relapse. And it was driving me crazy because we weren't really teaching the proper life skills. But in a partial hospitalization program, you can be able to do that. But the element of both that is really important to me is a therapeutic community because so many of these clients are isolated. Because what they find is, is that the stress that they have mainly comes from people. You know? People drive them nuts. And so if you stay away from people and relationships, that's the most helpful way of not having a full-blown manic episode. Unfortunately, you'll die of loneliness. So it's a catch-22. So the question is, how can you be with people and how can you be in relationships and not be precipitated through distress in some ways? And so I like life coaching as a component of the therapy because they need, they have social anxiety, oftentimes and so on. So we also have a place where they can live together uh, and they live together in a, like a sober living kind of place and they're interacting with each other and learning how to live in a therapeutic community and learning the skills of problem solving, communication, all those good kinds of things. And so there's sort of a two-pronged approach. One is to treat the illness, and the other one is to teach them life skills to be able to operate. And I think that's really one of the major pieces missing in so much of our treatment, is that how to be able to live in the real world and solve real life problems and deal with stress in the most effective ways. And oftentimes the only way people can do that is to fail at doing it and then learn from the mistakes. And so in a laboratory like a partial hospitalization, you can begin to do that. And the other thing is, is it's affordable. You know, that most insurance companies support partial hospitalization IOP because it's a less, lot less expensive uh, and it, it's highly effective. Okay, so um, we're turning now to the natural history, which is by page 18. And um, so we go to the next slide. That, um, first of all, just some interesting information. Men are more likely to be manic than women. That, um, that if the first episode is untreated, um, they're probably going to have another one within the year. And they'll have 10 or more episodes, and they're much higher risk for suicide. Um, and if they decide to go off their medication, which most do because of the side effects, um, they're definitely gonna have another episode within a year. Usually episodes are four years in between for, for mania. Uh, and the result is tremendous interpersonal occupation difficulties. A large number of my patients go on disability. Uh, and of course, I hate that because if they go on disability, then they're not really operating in the real world. They're bored to death. And I think we forget that not working and being bored to death is stress. And nothing is more stressful than that. And it's going to precipitate uh, more manic episodes. So to me, uh, going on uh, disability is not a, a, a good option. And I like teaching them how to be able to function. And uh, once we get them properly medicated, and on board a little bit. Honestly, you know, we treat uh, maybe 10 bipolar patients at a time here, and when they come in, they're pretty severe. Oftentimes, they're in the hospital for suicide, and they let them out after three days, and we begin to work with them. And I promise you that within 30 days, they're functioning pretty damn well with the help of really good psychiatry and the additional psychotherapy and therapeutic community. So a lot can be done um, if we approach this thing in an effective way. Later, I'm going to be less optimistic, but I, I do want to emphasize that. So usually, if there's a manic episode, if you can go to the next slide, you're going to give a person lithium. Lithium works in 40% of the cases. If not, uh, <clears throat> Depakote. Uh, and oftentimes, you go from into the monotherapy to other therapies, and so you might add to it lamictal wellbutrin, um, and oftentimes with the, the, on the depression end, the lamictal and the wellbutrin are certainly more effective. Lithium is not very good for the depression, obviously. Um, and remember that you're not going to get a clinical effect until about the 10 or 14th day of treatment. So you've got to hold them for a period of time until this stuff kicks in. And oftentimes it's too quick of a turn through us. You've got to educate people that you're not going to get really good effect 
a while down the line. Okay. Now, as I say, 30 or 40% don't respond. Well, actually 60% don't respond to lithium. Um, and uh, so you've got poor responders. The question is what to do. I wrote on here the MAOs because almost nobody uses MAOs anymore. You know, I, I, I when we, in the old days, there was a lot of Nardo being used. And it was so good, I think, with the depressive patients and the obsessive compulsive patients. <coughs> Most psychiatrists won't go near it because of the side effects with food. Um, but, you know, in these very, very chronic severe cases, I sort of ask the psychiatrists to be willing to try that. And uh, oftentimes uh, it, it can be effective when other elements are not effective. Now let's look at antidepressants for a minute because that depression is really one of the biggest problems. So a study looked at the switch from depression to mania with antidepressants versus placebo. In particular, with bipolar, two patients, they have more manic switches with the tricyclic. So, you know, it's really simple. Don't use a tricyclic. Um, the tricyclics uh, are contraindicated and oftentimes precipitate. The SRI, SSRIs, um, less so, uh, but they still can be problematic, as I've said. And so, you know, something well, like Wellbutrin um, as an alternative seems to be a little bit better. Some of the other um, SSRI alternatives. Um, but the manic switch rates with these antidepressants with unipolar major depression disorder um, can be substantially lower in these areas uh, if you give the right meds. So the APA guidelines warn that tricyclics have a greater risk for causing a manic switch, don't use them. Overall, clinicians need to be aware that antidepressants may not be as effective for bipolar depression as other agents are, and their somatic safety and tolerability profiles make them appealing to patients, particularly concerned about side effects. So the psychiatrist that I work with most often uh, is using Abilify a lot, and particularly because it's an injection form, and we know that they're getting the right dosage, we know that they're taking their pills, and we're not dealing with compliance issues, and boy, that's a great relief. The problem is it tends to be very expensive, and insurance, insurance companies uh, are gonna support that. Um, it becomes a problem. Now, the other issue is stimulants. As many of you know, that there's a ton of bipolar patients that are taking Adderall or Vyvanse because they have a hard time paying attention because they do have all the symptoms of ADHD and they can't focus at work and they can't do it. So a problem with that is that um, they're, they love being manic, who wouldn't? But mania, mania, as we all know, is not stable and it's progressive and eventually a person can become psychotic or completely out of control. And so what they like to do is they love to ride the fence. I want to be high, but I don't want to be manic. And um, so in educating the client, it's essential that they learn that riding that fence is not a good idea. And even though it feels good to be hypomanic, uh, it is not really conducive to work or relationships or living in general uh, for all the reasons that we've talked about. So I really encourage them to twick it down and to get back to a normal state rather than a hypomanic state. They love stimulants because it allows them to be able to ride a little faster than other people. It keeps their edge in certain ways. Um, and, but if you're using a stimulant with, let's say, an adolescent, you're going to get an earlier onset of bipolar one greatly worsens the course of the severity of the illness and can be contraindicated in the long run. Um, now, with an adult that's got severe depression, should you use a stimulant? Well, the answer to that is no one knows. It's pretty controversial. Probably depends upon the client. And there are some clients where they seem to do a lot better in functioning in the real world uh, using a stimulant. But honestly, it really needs to be monitored closely. And if at all possible, uh, a very low dosage uh, and 
close following, uh, as you may guess, and uh, differentiate where the person just wants to stay at a hypomanic state versus where it's absolutely essential for their functioning in some ways. So the general rule of thumb is I'd rather not use a stimulant if uh, only when we're desperate might we use that and that would be temporary. With a bipolar patient, it is, they're a chronic illness. And I like thinking of it sort of like epilepsy and that you're gonna have a seizure disorder and you need to do your dilantin. Um, and you need to accept that you have the illness and that it is a chronic illness and you're not gonna get better from it. And so patients spend about 47% of their lives in symptom states, especially depression. Um, and only 40% of patients really adhere with their medication regimes. So as I said earlier, one of the biggest difficulties is, is that most of the patients with bipolar are not on any medication. And of the patients who are on medication, 50% are only getting one med, which is ineffective. And then those who are getting properly treated are difficult to treat. So let me just say, you know, there is a crisis in how we're beginning to think about treatment of bipolar disorder. Now, you can ask the question, why aren't these uh, medications being used more, and why are so many people not being properly medicated? So in this one study that was looked at, it was a, a large study looking at people in the community who, um, got off their medications. And they got off their medications because they didn't feel they were effective after a short period of time, or partially effective. Um, and most of them got off because of the side effects. So you have to think about the side effect spectrums of each of these meds, particularly weight gain, and which ones are less likely to have that weight gain kind of side effect is gonna be one that's gonna be more useful. And you can see down the list some of the other reasons why a person goes off of it um, and some of the difficulties in just administering the meds and so on. But really, you know, that what this slide shows you more than anything else is that the side effect spectrum, like all psychiatric medication, turns to be out to be the most important thing. And, you know, there are certain drugs that don't have um, that kind of uh, long-term uh, difficulties with medications with side effects and, you know, the sexual side effects um, and the, um, the, the side effects with regards to um, weight gain would be less so with certain drugs. So like um, if you think of Latuda, for example, Latuda doesn't seem to affect sexual arousal at all. And that is a really good side effect spectrum. So Latuda is a particularly good drug uh, for people who are complaining about that side effect. Uh, some of the other drugs are much less likely to have weight gain associated with them. So that has to be a highly relevant variable in deciding which men, since obviously that's why people start. Now, the next slide, I think, um, is particularly interesting because Weiss and their colleagues found that 21% um, of patients adhere to treatment. Um, that's astounding. 13% um, took their medications one third of the time. Um, and also that 65% had an axis one comorbid diagnosis uh, and 43% had two or more diagnosis. So as I said, that what makes this more complicated then is that, you know, we're going to be treating eating disorder and bipolar. We're going to be treating chemical dependency and bipolar. And oftentimes you're trained in treating bipolar or you're trained in treating eating disorder, but you're not trained in treating both. And, you know, so some people say, well, how did I get into this? Well, you know, I started treating trauma. And when I treated trauma, I, I realized that so many trauma patients had addictions. And so I had to get better at treating CD. And then I had to get better at treating eating disorders, which is a whole another specialty. And after I mastered that, I realized that so many of the patients have PTSD, they have eating disorder, and they have bipolar. So I needed to become an expert in bipolar. And so thank God I have 50 years of experience because uh, you know each one of these there's a learning curve and that's why we're meeting today and talking about this stuff um, and I haven't yet even talked about the psychotherapy piece of that and what I've learned in that area so you know I think that's part of the difficulty with what's going on but it's helpful to see these slides because 
what you realize is, you know, you get kind of the sociology of this, what's currently being done and why it's not, it's happening the way it is, which is if you properly assess bipolar, are you also assessing the comorbidity? Okay, then the other thing I liked is to, men to mention that it is a spectrum disorder. And it, it, it's a little tricky because unipolar depression with hypomanic symptoms, irritability and hyperactivity, does occur, and some unipolar depression patients move to bipolar depression. So it could be that the medication is reasonable for a period of time and then stops working because they need to move on to a bipolar medication. Uh, I'm treating a client now who's got unipolar depression, but they're hypersexual, they can't finish a task, there's grandiosity, and it's starting to look more and more like bipolar. And so the psychiatrist and I are are wondering roll out bipolar. And one of the things again about a partial hospitalization program is as we rule this out, we might begin to add to their medication regime, you know, something in the area of an atypical antipsychotic um, like Zyprexa uh, and be able to see what effect it might have in helping control the depression. And a group of 76 patients with major depressive disorder. Benazel found an average of 2.8 hypomanic symptoms per patient. They had worse clinical course, higher comorbidity, and poor response. So what you see is, is that these are not necessarily clean disorders. And that's why clinical experience is so different than what happens in these experiments in the laboratory, because what we're seeing in the field oftentimes is more of the spectrum disorder than what you typically would get in a unified sampling uh, within a uh, uh, an experiment. So I, I don't want you to get lost in the details of this slide. What I'm trying to emphasize here is, is that with DSM-5 on the bottom, um, that you're getting manic with mixed features and depressive with mixed features uh, as a more common diagnosis. And there's a more of a realization of the spectrum disorder that we're talking about. So the question is, what, when does unipolar depression turn out to be bipolar depression? And what are some things that we can look for? And one are the mixed features where if they're having 2.2 hypomanic symptoms, that becomes important. And the client oftentimes don't tell us that. That's why a lot of these problems that we're seeing need to be understood that it's an ever-changing kind of diagnosis. And the things to look for if you have a unipolar depression is um, do they have a family history of bipolar? Um, bipolar is the earlier age of onset. Um, and uh, onset of depressive illnesses in autumn or some damn reason. And uh, some move towards psychosis or suicidality. And they're not sleeping at night. They're going whole nights without sleeping. That's a, a dead ringer. Um, the past or current substance abuse. Uh, and then the emphasis, which I want to talk about today, is the history of child abuse and other stressors, uh, which is, you know, the mainstay of our treatment, <laughs> you know, if they're not responding to the antidepressant. Okay, so in this slide, what I show you is sort of the typical advised way to approach that. And it's really more for psychiatry which is, you know, what do you do? You start with lithium and atypical antipsychotic mood stabilizer, antidepressant, and then you move down the line if you're not getting an effect. So this, you want to begin to think about this in a coordinated way. Since I'm not mainly focusing on psychiatry today, I'm going to move on from this. If you were a psychiatrist, this would take probably the whole lecture. Okay, so um, stage one, you're optimizing the mood stabilizer. You're ruling out drugs and alcohol. Uh, try to get family in and be able to look at what's going on. Stage two, um, move into Lamictal, uh, uh, Latuda, uh, or Depakote. Stage three, um, if you're running to a, a severe depression, think about Wellbutrin uh, first, and then one of the others, alternative SSRIs. Uh, and then uh, if that isn't working, consider. And then stage four, um, you have the MAOs, 
uh, and atypical antipsychotics or change it in some way. It says here tricyclics, but they're also contraindicated, so I don't think that's a good idea. All right, so the question then, you know, in everyday practice like yours and mine is, you know, should you use the antidepressant? You've got this really severe client, they're not responding to the medication, should you go into it an antidepressant? And first of all, there's no consistent evidence of efficacy, so that's, as we said, antidepressants oftentimes induce manic episodes uh, or hypomanic switches, uh, which ain't good, uh, and they can cause mood instability, and there's little evidence of suicide prevention. So, uh, Miklowitz uh, says against. What's the efficacy for antidepressants? Well, um, that uh, somehow um, you're desperate in some way, and maybe some of the evidence of moving towards a manic episode was due to the tricyclics, and maybe the SSRIs can be helpful with certain selected clients. Um, and the mood stabilizers successfully treat the primary cause of suicide, which is depression. You know, what I would say about this is make sure that you're using cognotherapy for depression, because we all know that it's highly effective with depression. And um, before you're going to add an SSRI uh, because you're desperate, um, make sure they're getting adequate good psychotherapy. <clears throat> All right. So this is the self-reported idea of treatment and uh, why they changed treatments in the past. They didn't feel like it was working in 63% of the cases. The doctor recommended a switch for its impact on physical health or was hard to incorporate into their lives. So if the major problem is compliance, we better study why these medications are not being complied with in some ways. And again, what I say is, is that now that we have injectable forms, you know, can we convince the insurance company that the only way to control this illness is by using the injectables uh, and will they support that, uh, which makes the most sense to me. All right, the second biggest problem is alcohol, and now all these um, amphetamines and opiates that people are using. Uh, and, you know, Christ, you know, the average client that I'm seeing these days uh, with bipolar is because they come in because they're alcoholic or they're bipolar. And the reason why alcohol abuse is so big um, is because it seems to be uh, helping the person regulate themselves. And the question is, why would that be so? I think of it as <clears throat> what happens with these drugs is that when you get high, high, you need something to bring yourself down. When you get low, low, you need something to bring yourself up. And like an eating disorder, for example, it works in both directions. When you're um, feeling just out of control, it, it, you use the eating disorder to bring yourself down. And then when you're feeling really, really low, you bring the eating disorder to bring yourself up. It works in both directions. So it, it tends to work until it kills you. And so you come in and you try to rip out the eating disorder, which is you know the goal of eating disorder treatment, and th then the person suicides. Well, <clears throat> we're not really looking at, you know, we, we look at treatment success in the eating disorder facility as we got the anorexia under control, or we get the binge eating under control. But I don't like that because my emphasis is not on symptom change. My emphasis is understanding the whole clinical picture in a holistic way and helping a person create a life worth living. And so treating the symptom might be the first stage of treatment. And because it, in order to do psychotherapy, you can't have somebody who's you know, drinking every day. And you can't have somebody who's restricting because they can't even pay attention. And if they're bipolar manic, you know, they're never going to be able to respond to psychotherapy. So we want to get the symptom under relative control so that we can kick in the psychotherapy. And, you know, that's what I've always found. That we're really effective in what we do. But it's thank God to these new medications that are available that allow our psychotherapies to work. So the psychiatrist needs a competent psychotherapist to be able to work with the client, and the competent psychotherapist needs an adequate psychiatrist to be able to work. 
and we have to have these kinds of connections and friendships where we can talk to each other and teach each other, learn from each other. And what I love about my practice is, you know, I work with a couple of psychiatrists regularly and, you know, I can text them during the day. They can text me during the day. And I love the interplay between us and the, the mutual respect we have. And, you know, I, I found in other locations where I work, it's been very, very hard um, to be able to do that. All right, now we're going to get to the second part. We're going to talk about psychotherapy. So before we do that, why don't we take a second and see if there's any questions that people want to ask. We'll take a little bit of a breather because I'm probably imploding all this stuff to you. But the second half of my talk, I really now want to talk about what I do with the client psychotherapy. All right, so now I move to psychotherapy for bipolar. And let me just say, with all that junk that I just gave you, um, up to 50% of bipolar one patients don't recover um, from acute manic episodes within one year. Only 25% re re achieve full recovery and function. So um, psychotherapy is essential for bipolar. And I, I, the premise of what I'm gonna be saying to you is, in all the psychotherapy books for bipolar that I've read, and all the articles that I've read, they don't deal with the issues that I think need to be de dealt with. So I'm going to try to tell you what they are dealing with, why I think they're inadequate, and what they should be dealing with. And know that you know I tend to um, be a radical, so uh, forgive me for that. You know, in the end, I think all psychotherapy is about dealing with trauma and grief. You know, the more I work with this, the more I realize that. And you know, I'm going to give you a little bit of a commercial here, which is that. Next Saturday, for those of you who are local, is we're having a workshop and we're inviting Francis Weller, who's going to be talking about uh, trauma and, and, and grief. And um, he wrote this book called The Wild Edge of Sorrow, Francis Weller. I love this book. I read it maybe two or three times. And I, you know, I just was so excited because, you know, the, I've been trained in dealing with grief, but there's so much I didn't know. And this book, is really a, a kind of a, a tremendous help in beginning to deal with grief. And I think all psychotherapy has at the basis of it loss. And so what we're doing when we're dealing with in psychotherapy is these stages of grief, which is, you know, people are really angry because of the things that have happened. Like, what could you be more angry about than having a chronic illness? So you're angry about that in some way. And you're in denial. You know, I don't really have this illness. Um, and if I'm good, maybe it'll go away or whatever the kind of rational, irrational thinking is. And so, you know, the stages of grief apply. And so a person becomes depressed because they have the illness, they feel hopeless, and then they want to commit suicide. And so, you know, it, it may sound sort of basic and cliche, but the first thing is to say, you've got a chronic illness. Some people have diabetes. Some people have epilepsy and you have bipolar. And if you pretend that you don't, you're gonna be in deep trouble. So if you can accept that, so I can't tell you, I would say at least half of the patients that I've seen over the years, you know, will come in and say, they tell me I have bipolar, but I really don't. And I don't believe it. And, you know, so the first step is simply acceptance of the illness. And uh, we don't really have, can't show them a PET scan of their brain to be able to see it, but I can show them PET scans of other people's brains, which I tend to do in order to break down denial and minimization. Now, once you accept you have a chronic illness, unfortunately, there are so many other losses in people's life. And what we all know is that, you know, most of our clients are going to have really discrete episodes of PTSD or chronic trauma in their childhood. And, you know, the family is disintegrated. And so, they're going to have a parent who beats the hell out of them because, you know, they're disruptive in childhood. It was undiagnosed. So the teacher's been mean to them. The other kids have been mean to them. Um, their parents have beat the shit out of them, excuse my language. Um, and, you know, they've been traumatized in a whole variety of ways by others. And, you know, it, it's so tragic because, you know, you still have this idea that, you know, if, you, if a kid's misbehaving, it's reasonable parenting to punish them and beat them up and that we need to do is get them in shape 
but it doesn't work, it hasn't worked, and now we understand why, we understand what's happening in the brain. But it does potentiate and increase the probability of this occurring. So now we have the trauma of the bipolar disorder and we have the trauma of what parents, teachers, friends, and others do as a result of being different. And so we need to look at the natural history of the illness and all those things need separate treatment in varieties of ways. So fortunately, you know, I was trained in PTSD. I, I started 30 years ago in working with PTSD um, and particularly in sexual trauma. And as I've learned how to treat PTSD and complex trauma through Basil van der Kolk and so many others who've been my friends over the years, um, I've begun more and more to be able to apply that to this population. So what I want to say to you is, is that these newer therapies that are affect-based, like internal family systems, like affect-accelerated psychotherapy, like EMDR, like um, uh, expressive psychodrama, and somatic-based therapies, you know, these are the new tools that we as therapists have had over the last five to 10 years. And they have changed what we do almost as dramatically as the atypical antipsychotics and mood stabilizers has done. But in the literature, we're still cognitively behaviorally focused. And cognitive behavioral therapy is necessary, but um, it's oftentimes not uh, uh, sufficient. And so I always start with cognitive behavioral therapy, and it's good stuff. But unfortunately, many clinicians don't recognize that rarely is it sufficient particularly with the depth of the problems that are occurring because of complex trauma. Complex trauma, for those of you who are not acquainted with it, is what it's like to have um, bipolar in childhood and adolescence that's undiagnosed and untreated, and oftentimes people's response to it, which really is horrendous. Got it? So I always start at a cognitive behavioral level, so let's do that. You know, the first thing I want to do is look at sleep. If they ain't sleeping, we ain't gonna go anywhere. Excuse my language. But sleeping is so important. And so let us look at this. And it could be something as simple. Are they taking their Seroquel in the morning or are they taking their Seroquel at night? If they take it at night, it's highly sedative. It's great. If they take it in the morning, they ain't gonna be able to function. So that's why I say you've got to know enough about these meds to know to ask the question, when are you taking your Seroquel? Um, something like that can make a huge difference. Not that uh, Seroquel is typical anyway, but what I'm saying is let's look at sleep hygiene. And, you know, the first thing I do is I have a whole protocol to teach people good sleep hygiene. And as we all know, cognitive behavioral treatment for sleep hygiene is essential and it's highly effective. And we're going to work until we can get a person having a sleep rhythm. And honestly, there's a lot of good psychotherapy oriented for bipolar, which just focus on teaching people how to sleep and have proper sleep rhythms and noticing those rhythms and understanding that sleep hygiene is at the very core of the bipolar disorder. So, you know, that's sort of number one on my list. If I think of it as it's necessary, but not sufficient, but let's start in a parsimonious way and build more complicated on top of that. Um, just like we're going to start with stabilizing the, the hypomania and then work from there, or stabilizing the alcohol and the eating disorder. We always start there, but that's not where we're going to finish. All right, next, um, we're going to look for collaboratives. And so the next thing I like to do, go to the next slide, is I like to bring the family in the wife, uh, an essential husband or the family in varieties of ways of working with young people, even with older people. And I like to give them my cell number and I want to have a formal relationship with them and they become collaborative in my treatment frame. And so I want them to understand the illness. I want to understand the biochemistry of the illness, the medication of the illness. And also, you know, it's the only way I can get accurate information. Um, my experience for 50 years is, is that if I talk to a man about his bipolar, I'll get maybe 25% of what I need. If I talk to his wife, I will get 50% you know, of what I need. 
oftentimes you're going to get much more accurate and much more detailed information than the person who lives with somebody. So oftentimes, you know, what I'll do, since so many of our clients are from out of state, is I get on the phone. And people love to talk on the phone. And I, my evenings are spent two or three hours, you know, trying to do detailed history uh, with the family of origin and, and with the current family. And each of those pieces are a frame that are going to help be able to do with the client. With oftentimes the therapists I work with, I don't know, they won't do that. It's just like, you know, they worked all day. They're not going to work at night. But to me, it's a commitment. You know, you just have to do it. And I can't do adequate treatment until I'm doing a proper assessment. The assessment includes what I do clinically, what I'm able to do with during various testing, and then the assessment has to do with talking to others. And then the treatment has to involve them because it, they'll pick up subtleties and changes that are occurring that I won't. And so they'll call me on the phone. I think she's in trouble right now. Here are the indicators of that. These are the signs that I've seen in the past. I think we need to do something to tweak our meds and tweak our psychotherapy or be able to do with, help her deal with the stress at hand. So I see this as a chronic illness. The patient is mine and it's a commitment that I make to the patient. And uh, I work a lot like a dentist, you know, where I am yours whenever you're having a cavity or a pain there, you call me up, I'm here. But I also like for that they're, if they're on medication that they're seen once a month, at least by a health professional. And we're monitoring this in some way. Um, and um, I say here, metacognitive awareness. And I'm going to talk to you a lot about this because metacognitive awareness means that they know as much as I do and that we have a checklist that here are the 10 indicators for you that you're in trouble. And I do what are called fire drills. You know, fire drill is that, you know, I smell smoke right now. I'm going to go investigate it. What are the steps you do if you notice that there is a fire? And let me give you an example. One of my clients, who I happened just to see last night, who's delightful, um, I love working with her because what she knows is that in her metacognition, which is observing herself from above, that if something starts getting not right and she starts going faster and she starts not sleeping, that she does a PRN Zypraxa. And oftentimes that helps stabilize her. And she says, look, I have got to work because I am dependent upon the income. If I get manic, I am not going to be able to keep my job and I desperately have to keep my job. And so you and I are going to collaborate on this. If the Zyprexa does not stabilize, she checks herself in to the local psychiatric hospital for the weekend. And for the weekend, she's able to get stabilized there uh, in a variety of ways, and she can go to work on Monday or Tuesday. And honestly, I, you know, I wish all my clients would do that because it's just so wise because they know that they want to be able to function. They know that they're, and she loves being manic, but she knows that the cost of that is just too great. She's paid the, the piper before. So that's sort of the way I like working with the client. And I don't mind them calling me saying, you know, it's, I'm in, I think I'm in trouble right now. And I say, come in at 7 a.m. tomorrow, come in at 6 o'clock tonight, I'll see you today, um, because I want to catch it right at the moment and support that process in some way. So, you know, I guess uh, you know, some people would say I have bad boundaries. Um, I, I, that's not how I feel. All right, so next slide. That um, you're enhancing metacognition in disorganized patients. And you want to increase their reflective capacity, as I've talked about. Um, and they need to know something about the past, present, self, other, child, adult. And what I mean by that is that um, oftentimes they change ego states. And uh, the part that is in control sort of hijacks them, to use Dick Schwartz's term. And they're becoming like another person. And the person that I know as the identified client begins to change. They become childlike uh, and start talking, thinking, and acting like a child. Um, or they become hyper-aggressive. You know, I haven't mentioned in this whole talk, you know, one of the major symptoms of bipolar is irritability. And it is really hard to deal with that irritability and anger off the wall. And 
Um, so when a person is highly irritable or angry, that's sort of where I work. So the client will come in and they'll say, you know, I'm noticing that my irritability is up by about 30%. Everything is pissing me off and I'm losing my temper quickly. I'm highly impulsive and I'm biting people's heads off. Okay, that's the time to call Mark. And so when they come in, you know, I call it mission impossible. You know, do, 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 do. I have to do something in that session around irritability and anger that's going to turn the volume down in that in some ways. So my training as a trauma therapist is to follow the irritability. And in hypnosis, we used to call that a affect bridge. And the affect bridge, follow the affect, and it will typically lead you <coughs> to the work that needs to be done in certain ways. And so irritability and anger oftentimes lead you to what's going on. And you follow that affect. And what you find is this, that oftentimes an injured part of self begins to manifest. That. So let's say that the person happened to be beat up by his father on a, on a daily or weekly basis. And every time that he acted out, he got punished severely and aggressively. Uh, and there's tremendous rage at the father for uh, mistreating him in that way. Well, a lot of therapists would say, well, shit, we need to treat the bipolar. We can't treat, you know, the abuse from the father. What I say is we have to go to both. That to understand the irritability and anger, we have to do that. Now, you can ask the question, is it wise to do trauma work with a client who is out of control uh, and biochemically? And the answer is, it isn't. You need to stabilize the person medically and stabilize the bipolar, but follow the affect. That doesn't mean don't ignore it in some ways. So a lot of people will say, well, for the you know, first year, we're gonna just treat the and stabilize, and then maybe a little later down the line, we'll get to the father beating the hell out of you. I like working simultaneously. I like to stabilize, and then go in and get to the root of the problem and begin to root that out in some ways. Now, there are not a lot of empirical data on this. All I can tell you is clinically, it works for me. And I like doing the deeper work and trying to get at what's behind this in a variety of ways. And oftentimes, there are these wild stories of things that have occurred in the family of origin. And so if I can get the father in and we can talk about what he did and why he did it and how he did it, and we can do some family work around that. Imagine how useful that is. And so I like working with the father, helping him become uh, an adjunct to the therapy, helping him understand what he did, why he did it, and help him begin to make amends if necessary. And you can say, well, you know, aren't parents usually in denial of minimization? They are, but if you know how to work with them in a non-shame blame way, Oftentimes, you can get the parents to be very cooperative around this process because they're watching the person potentially die and they're desperate to help them like you are. And, you know, the idea is that the truth will, um, will come through. And if we can begin to deal with the truth the way it happened and look at what happened to the parent along the way, because so oftentimes the parent has an undiagnosed psychiatric disorder and they need treatment too. And uh, if the, you can contextualize that, it begins to make sense because I'm not into blaming families. I am into working with family of origin in a ameliorative kind of way. Okay, so this is a little complicated, so don't get um, somehow pulled back by the complexity of this. A guy named Paul Weisinger, who I talked to on the phone, I like him a lot. And he has what's called a metacognition assessment scale. And I tend to like that because I'm not, when I think about metacognition, I, I, you have to sort of look at it in a detailed way. And so what it says here is at this level, the individual is able to maintain mental health problems by thinking about them differently. The individual may use adaptive self-statements to replace maladaptive statements and may reframe the problem behavior in a more positive or realistic way. And so if she says, you know, I'm having a seizure disorder, I'm having bipolar episode, it's coming on, I need to medicate myself, you know, just like a person with epilepsy has done, he takes a dilantin. That's a whole different way than the shame model of feeling like I have a mental illness and that I'm sick and that it's hopeless. And the individual is able to understand and modify the beliefs, perceptions, and expectations and thoughts that they have around this. So part of the fire drill is we're going to look at 
you know, what they say to themselves as a result of that. And so I've sort of categorized that, which I'm going to be showing you a little down the line, which is there are three categories of assumptions. One is acceptance. Acceptance is, you know, I have this disorder. I, I need to know that and accept it. And I am lovable. I am worthwhile. I am likable. And I need to have people in my life. I can't just isolate myself. So many of the clients I see are isolative. Two is competence. I am competent. I can be effective and powerful. I don't have to do things perfectly. I don't have to be successful at everything. Uh, and making a mistake isn't a failure. And three is control. Um, you feel out of control when you have a chronic illness. So control is an illusion. And there are some things I have control over and some things I don't. I can ask for help, and that doesn't mean that I'm a failure. So in a simple kind of way, there are just three categories. One of acceptance, two is competence, and three is control. And so the self-statements around those become critical. And so at a cognitive behavioral level, we are going to work on these self-statements. We are going to teach them what in a fire drill when they have the feelings of hopelessness and despair, of isolation, of people who are a pain in the ass, the, what they need to do and how they can begin to change that. And so that is not optional. We are going to do cognitive-based therapies, um, just like we need to help them sleep. We have to do the cognitive behavioral work first. And we have to work with their loved ones and particular spouses to be able to not feed those negative beliefs and encourage the positive ones. So that's a big area. So I'm family focused, I'm doing psychoeducation. Next thing I'm gonna do is a lot of work around communication. I see a lot of couples where there are bipolar episodes uh, or a bipolar one and bipolar two. And, I'm, and honestly, they need me. I mean, they really need me on a weekly basis or a bi-weekly basis or a monthly basis to do problem solving because um, that one person is just taking on too much stuff and working late into the evenings. Um, they're doing too many things at once um, or they're so damn depressed they can't get out of bed and the person's sick and tired of somebody who's sick and tired. And so, honestly, the couples therapy, which I've been trained in, you know, I was originally trained by Masters and Johnson. So my original training was as a couples therapist and, you know, I got trained by Gottman and Susan Johnson and all those great people and, you know, and tightened it up a little bit. But really doing good couples work and doing family therapy is essential. So you see the problem is, is that rarely is a therapist trained as a marital therapist, as a family therapist, as an eating disorder therapist, as an alcohol therapist, as a bipolar therapist. Um, it takes tremendous skills. And then, you know, we have hypersexuality. So can you deal with the sexual problems? They have sexual dysfunction or hypersexuality. So what I've tried to do over my 50 years is if I get trained in one thing and master it, get trained in another thing and master it, and yet I wonder how the hell I could do this work if I didn't have all this. And even then I feel inadequate. So I brought a team together. There's 10 of us here. And one of my therapists deals with somatic-based therapy. One of the therapists are really good with dialectical behavior therapy. One of the therapists is really, really good at expressive therapies and psychodrama and so on down the line. And by having a whole combination of therapists with different skills, I can take the same client and say, I think you need to see my partner for a while and deal with this piece or deal with that piece. And so I love working in a collaborative way with the team, which is why you know a PHP IP kind of format is so helpful or something like this. You're probably saying, you know, easy for him, you know, he can do that. What do I do in my own private practice? And the answer is it's really good to get to know people in your area that you can collaborate with, have meetings where you get together and talk about this and really work in a collaborative way, not only with psychiatrists, but other therapists in your area. Because, you know, if they develop an eating disorder, you're going to have to deal with the anorexia, uh, whether you're skilled or not. And yet, you, you're going to have to deal with it adjunctively with the bipolar. Or if they begin to use opiates, we have to have a special with opiates and so on down the line. And so you have to work more as a team in some ways. Okay. So I'm going to look at the automatic thoughts they have, I'm gonna look at their sleep patterns. Now I'm gonna look at triggers. 
And triggers are stress, stress management. And there are almost always triggers, like in a relapse prevention model, that will send them into a manic uh, stage or a depressive stage. And so relapse prevention, uh, in a detailed sort of way, becomes critical. So you see, I'm using all my tools, and I need to see what their triggers are that have sent them into an episode. Irritability and angry is really big, but you know, it's the usual thing. Losing a job, having your husband or wife want to leave you, um, having time where you're not busy. These are the common kinds of things that are going to trigger, and I want them to be able to identify you know, these high risk situations and be able to identify this is the time that you need to move into your uh, apparently irrelevant decisions, uh, to looking at your uh, ineffective coping responses, and, you know, to have sort of a, a, you know, something really directly that they can go to that, you know, that allows them to be able to know what to do net first, second, third, and fourth in a kind of a cookbook kind of way. So I always like, here are the triggers, and we put a note card of that, and here are the five things with each of these triggers that you need to do, and you're gonna have these note cards, you're gonna carry them with you in some ways, or you're gonna put them on your phone, and you're gonna be able to look at them, and there are four things you need to do, the fifth one is to call me. So in my relapse prevention model, they've gotta do the four things first before they turn to me, um, and when they call me on the phone, I'm going to say, did you do the four things on your list? Now, the next slide is something that we come up with ourselves. And this is a life skills assessment. And uh, in this life skills assessment, what we're measuring are where their life skill deficits are. And this is the missing piece of a lot of what I had done previously in therapy, because I've worked in, in residential and inpatient settings, and I wasn't doing adequate life coaching. And so I'm just going to read those to you across the line. Do they have constructive thinking skills? Do they have longitudinal living skills? Do they have friendship skills? Do they have um, parent-child boundary skills? Do they have self-care skills? Do they have time management skills? Do they have physical and environmental intimacy skills? Do they have goal-setting skills? Do they have social skills? Do they have self-care? Self-care, self-care, self-care. Uh, money management, um, being able to work in transitional skills, I'll tell you about that in a minute. Self-care, personal hygiene, job keeping skills, decision making skills, emotional awareness skills, um, job seeking skills, looking for a job, problem solving skills, organizational skills. Um, uh, the, the somehow uh, concentration skills, ADHD and technological skills. So I developed a 350, pay, 350 item uh, measurement device, uh, borrowing from some other devices that I found in the literature and, and working adjunctively and putting it together. And they answer these 350 questions and then I come up with a graph like this so I can prioritize where their skill deficits are. And then I have a specific intervention for each of these skill deficits. And what I find is, is that I can't necessarily do this in my office. If I try teaching them this stuff, it doesn't stick. So many of the bipolar clients, you have to do it rather than teach it. So um, I've started using life coaches now, and I identify here's the skill, here's the package. I went out and I read much of the literature on life skills and, and uh, for life coaches, and it was pretty inadequate. Um, it didn't do what I needed done, particularly for the bipolar patient. So I've begun to develop little packages for you know, job seeking, what needs to be done, or uh, stress management, what needs to be done, or problem solving, what needs to be done, or dealing with difficult people at work, what needs to be done. And we have a little package that gives them the sort of how to do it, and then they get rehearse it and practice it either in psychodrama or in the real world. And I have life coaches that are willing to do that. As you can guess, the problem is how does anybody afford to see a therapist, a psychiatrist, a life coach, and a dietitian at the same time with their eating disorder? And the answer is they can't. So I've got to figure out a way of working adjunctively that these people can be part of my program and we can identify where the real deficits are 
and can identify what needs to be done in a time limited setting. So in a PHP program like this, what I like to do is give everybody this on the front end and then everybody has homework to do on a nightly basis. And I'm gonna get them either working with other clients or working with the life coach to be able to do some of these things in the hours that they're not here on the weekends and so on. So every weekend they have assignments, every evening they have assignments, and practice, 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 life skills are essential in this way. So what I'm saying, just to repeat myself, is that the thing about the bipolar patient that I find is that they do not have the ability to learn like other people do. That they need, that they cannot learn by my giving them a book to read or by teaching them, or even in group therapy. They need to do it, make a mistake, and then be hammered in, this is what you're doing, it isn't working, this is what you need to do, it is working, let's try it this week, and let's practice it, practice it, practice it. Stress management, life skills, are the two key pieces to managing this. And what I'm telling you is that it's as valuable as working with a atypical antipsychotic. You know, that stress is what it is that induces these episodes, you know, and it's no different than with the <coughs> seizure disorder. You know, seizure disorders are treated medically, but you know, the truth about seizure disorders is, is that not handling stress or difficulties in life is what precipitates a seizure. And you know, we need to begin to think of bipolar as sort of like a seizure disorder and on that spectrum. And that if you can handle these things and teach them how to be able to and deal with these stresses in a cognitive way, in a behavioral way, in an effective way. They can maintain a marriage, they can maintain a job, and they can have friends, but they need practice, 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 and they need to know what's not working and what to do when it's not working in order to make it happen in some way. So you see what I'm saying? It's holistic is all I'm saying. That holistic is necessary. And when they're stressed out, they need to do a timeout, they need to do meditation, meditation, meditation. And so, you know, I, I want to teach them mindfulness. I want to teach them meditation. I want to teach them stress management. I want to give them life skills. And that's always the, the basis of some of this. It's necessary, but not sufficient, because so much of this is they've got old trauma from the past. And unless we deal with the old trauma, it's not going to be effective in some ways. An example of this that I'm saying is, is that uh, I have a client who is currently stable on medication, um, really uh, in a fairly stable state. And now what we're beginning to do is slowly peel the onion. And what we're beginning to do is deal with some of the incredible um, PTSD that he experienced, um, both in the military and also from his childhood in some ways. So, you know, if this doesn't sound complicated enough, add to it that we treat vets. And so, you know, they have 40 episodes of PTSD in Afghanistan and Iraq on top of all of this in some ways. And now that the women we're treating, oftentimes they have sexual abuse in the military on top of what we're treating. So there are layers, you know, it's like you have the bipolar, you have the eating disorder, you have the PTSD in Iraq, and then you have enormous amount of, of childhood abuse and neglect that you're treating. And what I'm saying to you is it's not enough to treat just the top layer because you're going to get more and more episodes. And the reason why the people have multiple episodes over long periods of time is what we all know is, is that if you don't work with the family of origin and trauma stuff, eventually it's going to come to the surface. And particularly if you get the eating disorder, the alcohol abuse, and, the, and some of the here and now issues under Control, what pops up next is unresolved stuff from the past, grief, trauma, and so on. And so we tend to do deeper work with such people that other people might think would be contraindicated. You know, do you really want to deal with incest with somebody who's bipolar? And the answer is you damn well better because uh, probably treatment of the incest is as critical as you know working with an atypical antipsychotic. And so um, but you've got to stabilize them first and then do the depth work underneath it in some ways. But you know, the way we do trauma work these days is such that you can do it in layers in a safe way and it doesn't have to precipitate you know, more and more. 
I must admit that I've made mistakes uh, as I'm learning. Sometimes I have not done enough proper stabilization and that my pacing has been off. And so sometimes my psychotherapy has precipitated on a manic episode or a manic episode. And in many ways, I feel that's unconscionable. So just like people have given SSRIs and feel like androgenically they've caused a problem, what I've realized is that I need to figure out how to do um, trauma work and family of origin work and pacing it so I atrogenically don't produce the disorder. And that really has to do with pacing. Honestly, as a trauma therapist with 30 years experience, what I would say is the number one thing a person has to learn in doing trauma work is how to pace it. So if you've been trained in EMDR and you take a, a week-long course, you know, being able to learn EMDR, which I have, uh, I've taken two. And what becomes essential is not just having the tool, but knowing how to use the tool and how to pace it with different disorders in a variety of ways. So I do use EMDR, internal family systems, and so on, but there has to be proper stabilization uh, and the pacing needs to be a lot slower uh, over a longer period of time. And we're gonna do a piece of work, integrate it, do a piece of work, and integrate it. So uh, basically one of the things I'm saying to you is, is that, um, Unfortunately, there are no longer easy cases that uh, the more you know, the more you realize that. And oftentimes the reason why there's so much bipolar that is not adequately treated these days is because not just the medical part of it, the compliance part of it, but because people are trained in just cognitive behavioral therapies or, or just PTSD therapies or just eating disorder therapies or just the alcohol abuse therapies. And most of us are realizing as the years go on that what we're doing is necessary but rarely sufficient. And so the more we think of this in a holistic way, the more effective we're gonna be. Okay, just a little bit more. I'm gonna do one more piece and then I'll take some more questions. Most couples that you see where there's been a, one person diagnosed with bipolar would say, will say that if they had to do it again, they wouldn't have married the person with bipolar. That's pretty important. Well, so you gotta do couples therapy. And um, I like uh, having the spouse as a co-therapist. Uh, I work a lot with couple stuff and what's going on between the, 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 the two partners and teaching them communication skills, teaching them stress management, teaching them problem solving skills and working with them on communication and working with the psychodynamics of why they chose each other and the depth work um, and the attachment work that goes underneath it in some ways. If you haven't seen my um, webinar on attachment, it's on our website. I would watch that. I spent two hours talking about some of that work. But the real work that I've done that I think is totally revolutionary is the intra-psychic work within the individual. And honestly, if you look at the way I practice now compared to five years ago, it doesn't even, it, there's no similarity at all. Because as I got trained in working with dissociative features, what I've come to understand is that the real psychotherapy is in internal integration. I had Dan Siegel here a couple months ago, and he said, you know, neurons that fire together wire together. And the key element in understanding the mind is integration. Integration being a concept in the brain of integrating systems in the brain and integration being uh, in the mind and taking fragmented parts of the personality and helping integrate them so a person has an integrated sense of self. And so having trained now in dissociative theory, so much of my work has changed where I'm working with dissociative parts. And there is going to be a part that is filled with rage and anger. There's going to be a part that is a childlike part that hasn't grown up. There's going to be a part that hasn't yet, that's adolescent and is impulsive and acting out in varieties of ways and so on down the line. And each of these are different brain systems that lack integration. And so as you think of bipolar being a mood disorder, it is also a lack of integration of brain systems. And a lot of these medications are facilitating that process. You know, I making neurons fire. But the other way of making neurons fire 
is by in your office being able to access affect at a deep level. So, so many of my clients, they're bipolar, they're highly cognitive. They do not experience or express emotions and affect. And so parts of self that are expressed, they've disowned long ago because they've been dangerous. If you're out of control and impulsive, you damn well better put a lid on your emotions or you're gonna hurt somebody or you're gonna hurt yourself. And so what the cost of over control is out of control. And that's the whole basis of all trauma theory. Uh, over control results in out of control. So you have to go in and take the cork off of some of that suppressed affect and that uh, cognition and begin to bring affect to the surface in a safe way and integrate cognition and affect. So that's theoretically what we do. How we do it is, you know, if a person has incest, we are going to have them work on that incest in a safe way and be able to work with that injured part of self that is frozen back there in time and begin to integrate that with the adult self. So most of our model of treatment is repairing. The client is taught to repair itself. And our great teacher was Dick Schwartz. Well, Dick Schwartz in his internal family systems model said, all psychotherapy is self-healing. The therapist is a facilitator to self-healing. So we're gonna work with the adult self, teach them the skills to be effective as an adult through life skills training, and then have that, that adult self begin to repair it, the injured parts of self and be able to deal with that. Now you say, well, Mark, isn't this like long-term psychotherapy? And the answer is, I guess, but we tend to do this in a 30, 60 day model. You know, if you're seeing somebody three or four times a week, which we are, you can do each of these layers actually uh, in the process of therapy because you're seeing them for three to six hours a day and all of it is targeted in these areas. And um, so you can do pieces of this work in lots of different ways. So that's what we're trying to do. And you know, since I'm at that point in my career where I'm trying to look at my treatment failures and see what I haven't been doing that needs to be done, I'm tweaking it continually, trying to tighten it, sharpen it, so on, and look at what's not being done that needs to be done in onion-like layers and saying, this needs to be done, this needs to be done, this needs to be done. How can we get that into a six-hour day? What needs to be done first and who needs to do it in a variety of ways? And you know, something like, Dialectical behavior therapy is incredibly useful because they, they talk about affect expression, affect tolerance, and so on. What better model is there for working with affect than dialectical behavior therapy? So that has to be a component of it, and so on down the line. Okay, so I hope what I've said, just to sort of summarize, is that, that each of these models of psychotherapy have been necessary but not sufficient. There has been overemphasis on cognitive behavioral therapies and psychoeducation. Those are necessary but not sufficient, like in general. And that I like doing depth therapies and pulling something, going to the base of these things. And I find that it's absolutely essential when you have somebody who's got, you know, adult PTSD, childhood PTSD, complex trauma, eating disorder, alcohol abuse, sexual compulsivity, and bipolar disorder which is my average client. Okay, let's take questions. My experience with relapse prevention is that it's really essential. We have a group where we do nothing but relapse prevention every week um, for an hour and a half. So it's not simple, something simple. What we like to do is we like to lay out the relapse prevention cycle and then have every client map their relapse and then anticipate their next relapse and look at thoughts, feelings, and behaviors and make a chain analysis of it. And you're gonna get that chain analysis and be able to look at it in some ways and we do fire drills. And so practice, practice, practice. Okay, so it's my son has been recently diagnosed with bipolar and very angry and drinking and feel uh, discouraged. Please don't feel discouraged. Uh, um, the, the, you know, we work with bipolar every day and the treatment is very highly effective. You know, the, the problem is, is that, you know, th there's just so much new that's happening, but it's so encouraging because we now have these atypically psychotics and mood stabilizers, more of them being invented every day. 
And honestly, each one of them is different. It's so amazing. You know, if you work with Clauseril, it's very different than working with Zyprexa. And so if you get a person who really understands this illness and looks at it in that way, you know, we can do so much more than we could five years ago or 10 years ago. So, you know, I am not discouraged. I am discouraged that we as professionals um, are not adequately training ourselves to be able to address this in a holistic way. And that's what I'm yapping about today because, you know, all of us, um, it takes a lot of skill to be able to deal with this. And uh, the idea of it is to know that what we're doing is necessary, but rarely sufficient. And, but, you know, the honest truth is we can do proper diagnosis and assessment on the front end and then come in with a treatment plan, uh, which is holistic and comprehensive and lay it out. It's very, very effective. All right, how do you encourage your clients to go on medication for bipolar that's the right method for them? In my experience, so many people that have bipolar are scared to take medication and fear that they'll be zombies. Yeah, right. I guess that's the biggest problem, isn't it? I appreciate you asking that. Because, um, but what I do is, you know, like I'm trying to teach you, I taught myself, which is, you know, what goes on when you take lithium? What happens when you take Depakote? Why do you take an atypical antipsychotic? What does it do in the brain? And once I figure that out, you know, which I don't need to be <coughs> very sophisticated to do, then I like getting pictures of it from the literature. And I lay this out and I say, here's your brain. Here's what's going on. Um, here's why it's going on. Here's what the medication does. And what we can do is we can take this abnormality in your brain and make it more normal. So if you have a problem with diabetes and your glucose is off, <coughs> obviously, if you check it every day, get your glucose in order, your brain is not going to deteriorate. You're not going to go blind. Now, if you don't want to have your brain deteriorate and go blind, then manage your diabetes. And here's how we're going to manage it. What's the biggest problem with diabetes? Is compliance. So like any other illness, it, you, know, you really have to patiently help the person understand if you don't do this, here's going to be the consequences if you do. So what I'm saying to you today is that understand that this is a progressive illness. If you cheat, if you treat childhood um, bipolar disorder, the adult is going to have a much more normal brain and much less episodes. And so, you know, parents hate putting their kids on medication, but if they understand that, you know, if they don't, there's going to be much more deterioration of the brain much more severe illness, much greater risk of suicide, uh, and many more adult episodes, then you can convince them to be able to accept the illness and to be able to medicate the child properly. Now, then you have to look at the side effect spectrums. Nobody wants to be obese, and nobody wants to have no sex drive. And so each of these can be understood by knowing the variety of medications and their potential side effects. And many of these drugs you know, I just read an article the other day, you know, basically showing that Latuda does not have any negative sexual side effects. It's the first published study. Well, that's cool because, you know, sexual side effects have been really a nuisance in so many of these antidepressants. All right, well, it's 11 o'clock. You probably have to go into your practice. The webinar will be available uh, probably next week or the week after. So will the trauma one that, that uh, I had Samantha do, who was on my staff. And she, boy, that was a great webinar. You're going to love that. So if you haven't looked at the series, Nicholas is on somatic and Samantha on trauma. And now this one, um, they really go together. So if I've whetted your appetite, um, we have sex, we have somatic, we have trauma, and then we have now bipolar. And uh, they're all on our web, webinar online. You can get uh, CEU credits for them, uh, and it's free. Anyway, thanks for coming. It's been really great. Those of you who are my friends, it's great to connect with you again and stay in touch. Thank you. Bye-bye.